Good morning, British literature scholars, and welcome to week two. So, um, last week, what I was hoping you were doing was that you uh, got familiar with our website and that you um, looked at the pre-1800s British literature uh, slideshow. That sets the stage for what we're going to do starting with this week. So, um, here's what I wanted you to get out of the British literature slideshow because these are the most important points that uh, will affect what happens from this moment forward as we go on our journey through uh, British literary history starting at around the year really 1795 um, which is the beginning of the Romantic period. First of all the British language, I mean the English language is a very strange language in that it is a mishmash of many different languages. So it started with the Celtic languages uh, starting uh, around uh, prior to 450 AD when the Celts, which were basically a band of warrior tribes, lived on the island. Uh, when the Romans invaded Britain uh, at the bequest of Julius Caesar, that turned out to be the invasion of Latin onto the island. So Latin started melding with these Celtic languages. But around 50 AD, when Rome was starting to fall to the Vandals, uh, Rome basically called all of their soldiers back to Rome to try and protect the city from falling. So uh, that opened this island up to the Anglos and the Angles and the Saxons, which is where the term Anglo-Saxon comes from. And these folks came over from Bavaria, which is essentially Germany now. So that, that kind of added a Germanic language to uh, the English language. But these folks had to actually resist the invasions of the Vikings that came in from the Scandinavian areas, particularly areas like Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. So that added Scandinavian languages to the Latin, to the Germanic, to the Celtic, and lo and behold, that had an effect on uh, English language. That would all change again somewhere around 1066 when William the Conqueror came in and started uh, adding French because he came in from Normandy, France by crossing the British, the English Channel. So then that added French to the language. And lo and behold, through various mutations over time, we get the English language that we have now, which is a combination of a whole bunch of languages. Um, another thing I wanted you to get from that was that there is a separation of church and state. Or, I'm sorry, a separation of the Catholic Church from England, which became the Church of England. And that came about because King Henry VIII wanted to divorce his first wife, Catherine. And uh, the Catholic Church said, oh, no, no, you're not allowed to divorce her. And King Henry VIII got himself excommunicated and said, okay, now I'll start my own doggone church, where he was able to divorce her and marry Anne Boleyn, who would end up being the mother of Elizabeth I, who was a really important queen in, Brit in English history because of imperialism. So, under Queen Elizabeth I, uh, English, the English Navy was basically strengthened a whole lot, enough to beat the feared Spanish Armada, and then they, uh, the English were allowed to go out and colonize. And of course, the United States exists because the English colonized areas like North Carolina, Virginia, and you know went basically right up the Atlantic coast there, from all the way from Vermont, New Hampshire, all the way down to Georgia. Uh, that was uh, started under Queen Elizabeth I and continued up until King George III lost the uh, English colonies on the North American continent, which then became the United States. So, that's kind of what I want you to get out of it also, is the separation of the Church of England from the Catholic Church, which would cause all kinds of civil wars. That whole War of the Roses was a big civil war. Um, the restoration was started because basically King Charles I got beheaded. Uh, so for 11 years, England did not have a king. It was ruled by the Puritans. And when Oliver Cromwell, who was leading this interregnum, as it's called, which is Latin for between kings, um, when he died, the English citizens said, we've had enough of these doggone Puritans. Let's bring our king back. So King Charles II, who was the son of King Charles I, was brought back to England under great fanfare and uh, was restored. So that's going to become important when we look at the French Revolution because 
the French Revolution is going to raise questions of do we need a king or not. England had already tried not to have a king and 11 years later restored him. So that's part of what you should have gotten out of that slideshow also. All right. So that leads us to now, the Romantic period. So what you should do is if you look at your uh, syllabus, you should read the introduction to the Romantic period. You can see it's about 27 pages in your textbook. It's going to set the stage for uh, how Romanticism was essentially a rebellion against the Age of the Enlightenment, or what is also known as the Age of Reason. Uh, the Age of Enlightenment, Age of Reason, said, hey, science can answer every single question in the world. We don't need God anymore. The Romantics would disagree with that. And the Romantics said, wait, uh, science can't answer questions of love, and science can't answer all these other questions. So the Romantics, uh, they also wrote about Gothic settings and... They also brought a little supernatural into their writings, which is where Col Coleridge will come in, that the Age of Enlightenment would have been horrified at. So, look at that introduction. Uh, read the selections from William Wordsworth. The first one comes from the preface to Lyrical Ballads. You can see I don't have you reading the entire preface in the textbook. I only have you reading five, chap five pages of it, excuse me, five pages. The chapter on what is a poet, where William Wordsworth is going to try to define what a poet is, and emotion recollected in tranquility. Um, and then you've got two of his poems, which are We Are Seven and Ten Turn Abbey. What's important about Ten Turn Abbey is he wrote this while looking over the ruins of what used to be a Catholic monastery in, Brit in England. However, after King Henry VIII separated from the Catholic religion, all those monasteries are shut down. And by the time we get to the Romantic period, all these what used to be monasteries are now basically ruins and they are these old buildings that are overgrown with weeds and vines and stuff like that that is what Ten Turn Abbey looks at and then for T Samuel Taylor Coleridge William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were good buddies they were what were known as the lake poets um, and they were buddy buddy and they were like the kings of the romantic uh, poets up until about 1830 and we'll take a look at the later Romantics uh, at that time. But <sighs> Coleridge liked the supernatural. And he wrote this poem, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is going to have supernatural elements such as ghost ships and death actually being personified and playing a dice game against a lady. And how the ship suddenly moves on its own and the dead will rise up. And all of this stuff is going to happen in Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is extremely... Uh, Fascinating, I think. I think you're going to like reading this. Here's what I would do is I, if I were you. Take a look at the discussion questions for this week. And that brings me to this point. I have emailed you this, plus this is in the uh, assignments folder in D2L. So I'll let you take a look at that. That is the instructions on how to do these discussion postings. If I were you, I would take a look at the instruction or the discussion questions and then read the, uh, the selections based upon that. You're going to have to answer a question about Wordsworth, and you're going to have to answer a question about uh, Coleridge. So, let me take a minute to go over this, because this spells out what my expectations are. I have put this in the uh, uh, folder, the uh, assignment instructions folder. I have also emailed this to you on the D2L email. So there's two ways you could have gotten this, plus I'm mentioning this in this video. So print this up, keep it handy, and use it at all times. These discussion postings are only two to three paragraphs each. So if you do both of them this week, the Wordsworth and the Coleridge, you'll have written somewhere between four to six paragraphs. That's it. Um, that's all you'll have to do. But it's not a throwaway assignment. You have to take these postings seriously because these postings are going to be where you decide what your research paper is going to be on. In fact, your research paper is essentially going to be an expansion of one of these postings. So, here's what we got. In two to three well-developed paragraphs, it can't be a couple of sentences per paragraph. Well-developed paragraphs answer the questions involved. Um, you should answer each question directly. You may also respond to somebody else's postings if you like, as long as you do it in two or three well-developed paragraphs. Just respond to somebody and saying, I agree, is not going to be good enough. That will count as a zero. 
you have to actually uh, expand upon it. I will grade your responses based on the following criteria. You must have a thesis. Treat these discussion postings just like you would any written assignment, especially in an English class. So there must be a thesis that you are trying to explore in this discussion posting. And there should be some development. So whatever your, whatever your postings are, they are trying to support whatever the thesis is. There should be nothing off topic. Whatever goes into your posting has to in some way relate back to the thesis. There should be a thesis statement, really. Um, relate back to the thesis. If it doesn't, then it would be a penalty for being off topic. I'm going to be looking at surface errors. What that means is I expect all your words to be spelled correctly. I expect you to use complete sentences. Please do not use text language. Do not put any OMGs, LOLs, or anything like that in there. Don't use any vulgarity. Treat this like you would any other paper. Um, and write it, because this is an English class after all, write it as if you would any other uh, writing. And it says I would encourage you to use direct quotes. I'm going to say you should use direct quotes. Not encourage it. I'm going to say do it. Pick quotes directly from the story. They should be formatted correctly and they should be cited correctly. How do you do that? You have a My Blank English book that you got in English 1101 and 1102. I hope you kept that because that can be helpful in citing properly. I also have plenty of MLA. There's an MLA folder that actually has instructions on how to uh, format quotations and format citations properly. I also have in the useful web links a link to the Purdue OWL, which is the gold standard. If you're going to cite the poems, and all of these are poems, you cite the poems by line number only in the quotation mark. I mean, in the parentheses, not quotation mark. You use the quotation marks if the quote is three lines or less. If it's four or more, you're going to actually use the uh, block quotations. Don't know what that means? Go back to your My Blank English book, go into the MLA folder, go into the Purdue OWL. There's plenty of information. There's no excuse now because you've already had two English classes for not knowing how to format properly in MLA and not knowing how to cite your quotations properly. So again, um, now if you're going to quote uh, from the uh, preface to the lyrical ballads, in that case you would do it like a prose quotation, not a poetry quotation. Again, all that information is in what I've already told you. So, a thesis statement, good development in the two to three paragraphs that you're going to type. No surface errors or very few surface errors. Do not treat it like a text. Treat it like a real um, you know, essay. And use direct quotations that are formatted and cited properly. Again, it's all in here. It's in your email. It's in the assignment instructions folder. So there's no reason why you shouldn't know what's expected. All right. So that's all I've got for you. This video is a little bit longer than I intended, but I just wanted to stress the importance of uh, getting these postings done right. You have until next Sunday night to do them, and then I will start grading them right away. I will try to give you plenty of comments on these first postings to make sure that you get the idea and that you're doing it properly so that you keep continue to get good grades throughout the rest of the semester. And also, again, some of you may choose to write your research paper on one of these two authors. So treat it seriously because whatever you write here could turn out to be your research paper topic. And that's all I got. So um, have a good week. I think you're going to enjoy Wordsworth and Coleridge, especially Coleridge. And um, just know that these are the two most important poets of the Romantic period. Um, read that preface very closely because... When Wordsworth defines what a poet is, that's going to set the stage for many of the poems that we're going to read over the next couple, three or four weeks. And that's it. So have a good week, and we'll see you next week.